Welcome back, everybody, to part two of our reaction series to Teddy Roosevelt Trust Buster from Extra History. Hope you guys enjoyed part one. A few of you commented on something about a little bit of an echo with the sound. I can't quite figure out what could have caused that. All my settings are exactly the same, and not everybody noticed it, and I did a little test run with this recording. It seems to be fine. So I guess we'll see. I don't know if it's just something about certain playback devices or hearing it and other ones aren't. But I uh, got everything as best I can do. Hopefully that's not too much of an issue. If you didn't see part one, there's a link in the description that will take you back to that first episode. We're picking up right where we left off. A um, couple of real quick announcements that I talked about yesterday in the stream. Uh, I am planning on going to Vicksburg sometime in probably mid to late August. If that's something you're interested in, I should in the next week or so have the exact date that we will be planning a meet a meetup, and we're going to do uh, several hours of touring the battlefield together, looking into seeing if we can even get one of the battlefield guides to come out with us uh, to show us around. So I am going to be there for a couple of days making content for the channel, but I want to set aside one day where we can get together anybody who might be interested to tour the Vicksburg battlefield with me. So if that's something you're interested in, make sure you have your notifications on because I will be posting with details about how you can be a part of that if you want to do that. We're also looking at uh, getting Camp Tacoa in Georgia for the weekend, hopefully sometime in October. Uh, we will spend the weekend there, sleep in the barracks on the base, hike Kurahi together, watch Band of Brothers on the base, uh, go to the Kurahi Museum in town. It'll be a lot of fun, a great opportunity to soak in some World War II history. So more details to come about that. Let's dive into part two. Cleveland, 1905. John D. Rockefeller enters the Baptist church he's attended since he was 14, a church that's still full of blacksmiths and shopkeepers, people he's known his whole life. Things haven't been easy. That Tarbell woman's articles have turned the world against him. His family is suffering nervous conditions, his wife paralyzed by stroke, and an unknown disorder has caused all of his hair, including his eyelashes and eyebrows, to fall out. For years, he'd let people treat his estate like a public park, but now he's building a fence. Armed Pinkerton bodyguards follow him everywhere, and he sleeps with a revolver by his bed. Even that cowboy president Teddy Roosevelt is after him, despite how generous Standard has been to Republican politicians. And we talked about that a little bit yesterday. It's uh, when Teddy Roosevelt runs as the running mate for William McKinley's second term. McKinley's previous vice president had died in office, and so they needed a new vice president for his second term, and they choose Governor Roosevelt of New York. Uh, thinking that it's a good place to hide him and put him away. And uh, McKinley's one of the first presidents that's really seriously backed by big money, uh, big business money, including the money from uh, John D. Rockefeller, who's also from Ohio, like William McKinley is. They're both Northeast Ohio guys. Um, but now Roosevelt comes to power and he doesn't kind of toe the party line. He doesn't kind of, he, he's a man unto himself. And like a lot of people have commented, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, if you have not heard his story, you have to learn it. Uh, there is a movie in the works. Apparently, Leonardo DiCaprio is going to play Theodore Roosevelt in the movie. I don't know how that's going to go, but the last time I heard a casting uh, decision that I thought was nuts, it was Heath Ledger playing Joker, and that turned out really well. So I am cautiously optimistic about Leonardo DiCaprio playing Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, but I hope they do it justice because that is a story everyone should know. The guy was like the ultimate American. He really, really was. Um, but uh, at the end, stick around to the end of this video because we're going to add a little something to this one. Uh, somebody shared with me yesterday a video of John D. Rockefeller, like an actual video of him speaking when he was like in his 90s. So we're going to watch that at the end of this video. But at least he feels safe here. At his church, where he gives Sunday school lectures and hands envelopes of money to parishioners who have fallen on hard times. His people. He doesn't see Ida Tarbell sitting a few pews away. Wait, so she showed up at his church in Ohio, in Cleveland. Like, I mean, is she like just... She, this is a gutsy woman, but I'm curious to know what her, like, is she trying to intimidate him? Because I don't know how you intimidate the world's first billionaire, but this woman has no fear whatsoever, and I admire her for that. Thanks so much to Ting Mobile for helping us keep the history flowing. Ida Tarbell's series, A History of the Standard Oil Company, ran in McClure's magazine until 1905, and it completely changed public attitudes about trusts and big business. 
Granted, when the big trusts like Rockefeller's Standard Oil and Andrew Carnegie's U.S. Steel were building themselves in the 19th century, they had caused a great deal of controversy within their industries on a state-by-state -state basis, but that anger and mistrust was unfocused. The business structures of these trusts were, often intentionally on the part of the trusts, difficult for the public to understand. Holding companies obscured the sheer scale of the trusts, and anti-competitive practices like railroad rebates and price fixing were so technical and detail-oriented, it was hard for individual citizens to pin down exactly what was wrong. And not only that, but this is a different time. You know, it's not like today where everybody's got access to uh, news 24-7 and we are inundated with information. Uh, first of all, newspapers for the most part at that time were pretty unashamedly partisan like you had you know you might have like the center county democrat you know i mean these were papers that were legit biased and they were intentionally so uh, they weren't trying to be fair and balanced they weren't trying to be unbiased they had an agenda and they were honest about that uh, and a lot of people didn't read the newspapers. Most people, you know, a lot of people didn't go to school up through high school and then go to college afterwards. A lot of people didn't have near the education they have today. Literacy, I think, I think in this time is probably like 80 to 90 percent. So literacy is still pretty high, but not as high as it is today. Um, so it's a very different world. And so people didn't have the level of knowledge about things going on as they do today. And like he said, not only that, but a lot of times public. Uh, it, it takes public opinion of something before the government will act on it sometimes. Uh, and that's sometimes good, sometimes bad. Um, in the aftermath of the Civil War, we're going to be doing some stuff about Reconstruction coming up here probably in a month or so. Um, Ulysses S. Grant, for example, was very, very supportive of the former slaves and probably one of the most pro-civil rights presidents we've ever had, certainly in that time period up until recent time. But public perception and public opinion of Reconstruction in the South started turning heavily against Reconstruction by the, by his second term, and it made it harder and harder for him to, to accomplish things. And some, so sometimes that works both ways. Sure, there had been some legislative action on standard, such as in 1892, for example, when the state of Ohio managed to use antitrust laws to separate Standard of Ohio from the rest of the company. But corporate reshuffles or protracted legal battles often blunted even these small victories. But now, Tarbell exposed how a network of 250 companies, many related in Byzantine deals, controlled everything from the price consumers paid for vegetables and alcohol to working conditions and hours across multiple industries. It's no different than today, right? I mean, there's a handful of companies that own pretty much everything. You know, Disney, uh, which Disney is, I guess, part of, uh, isn't that part of ABC? Um, General Electric owns a ton of stuff. I mean, there, there's a small number, probably even a small num smaller number than this that kind of own everything. More importantly, though, it presented this information cleanly by centering the investigation on Standard, the one trust owned and controlled by a single man. This kept the story comprehensible and gave the readers a central character to rally against. In fact, often, she described Rockefeller and Standard as if they were the same entity, even after he had retired to focus on charity. And she decided to close the series with a two-part personal sketch of Rockefeller himself, which is where the usually reserved Tarbell let the venom mm. flow. Describing him in church, she wrote that he looked like a living mummy, hairless and reptilian, powerful yet nervous, a ruthless king, terrified of assassins who might be in his midst. Seems a a little bit too far. I was on her side when she was sharing the information and explaining to people what was going on and their business practices, but now it seems like it's getting a little personal to me. I don't know how I feel about that. But in actuality, Rockefeller was not the broken man Tarbell suggested. Even as his family suffered under the public strain, Rockefeller kept playing golf and running his charitable foundation. Granted, getting annoyed whenever a prominent religious organization turned away a donation of his as tainted money, but still, he stayed silent, believing the controversy would only grow if he dignified it with a response. It grew anyway. Tarbell's series sparked a national sensation. She exposed family secrets, like that Rockefeller's father, Doc Rockefeller, had fled New York with the family after being indicted for rape. 
a Ooh, I didn't know that. Wow. Um, so, you know, they talk a little bit there about him giving a lot of money away and setting up charities and having retired from the day-to-day -day running of the business. And this was a pretty common thing that a lot of these early barons or tycoons did. People like uh, Vanderbilt and Rockefeller and Carnegie. Um, you know, what they did was they, you know, they used these ruthless practices to accumulate all this wealth. And then once they had more wealth than they could ever possibly spend in 20 lifetimes, they started giving it all away and kind of thinking about the future and their legacies. And so, for example, you go to anywhere in Western Pennsylvania and pretty much every town will have a Carnegie something, a Carnegie Center, a Carnegie Library, um, things like that. Rockefeller Center in New York City is a perfect example of some of the stuff that he set up. Uh, so you'll find these sorts of things. Their their footprints uh, and their uh, their charitable giving is all over the the country to this day. Scandal that only deepened when her research assistant caught wind that Doc was still alive, living under an assumed name. So now finding Doc Rockefeller mm. also became a brief national fixation, with publishing magnates Joseph Pulitzer and William Randolph Hearst dispatching reporters as far away as Alaska to try and find the man. And this is kind of interesting because guys like Pulitzer and Hearst were in many ways every bit as ruthless in their fields as Rockefeller was in his when it came to growing their brand and growing and getting the story and uh, having the power and the influence. Uh, it was just a different field and it wasn't one where they could make the same kind of money, but they did a lot of the same things. Um, in fact, Pulitzer is kind of one of the uh, antagonists of the musical Newsies. He's kind of one of the bad guys in that because he's the one that's putting everybody out of business and kind of running things differently and all that kind of stuff. Man. However, by the time they did, he was already dead. His poor widow, not realizing her marriage had been bigamous and her husband's son the richest man in America, had buried him under the assumed name of Livingston. With that minor side quest completed, the concepts of trusts and their impact on American life began becoming topics discussed at porches and town halls across the country due to Tarbell's articles. After decades of unfocused discomfort over monopolies, there finally seemed specific charges to answer and the political will to do something about the trusts. A public mandate that was a godsend to America's new president, Theodore Roosevelt. A reformer and longtime critic of trusts, Roosevelt had unsuccessfully attempted to pass anti-monopoly legislation in the past as governor of New York. And remember, as we said earlier, public perception and, and public opinion on this helps him a lot because if nothing else, what it does is it probably gets him some people in his own party to maybe be willing to side with him. Because remember, uh, if you're not familiar with government in the United States, Congress, our House of Representatives, which today has 435 members, um, they're elected every two years. And so they're intentionally with short terms and so that you know uh, there's often opportunities for the people to speak. If they don't like the direction that their representative is going, they can vote them out. Senators serve for six years and at this time, I believe this is before the amendment was passed where senators were directly elected by the people. So at this point, senators, the, the Senate, uh, two senators from each uh, state are not even elected directly by the people. They're chosen by the state legislatures, but it's still a six year term. So there's not a direct influence by the people. But if, if public perception, public opinion is strongly against the trusts, you're much more likely to get the Republicans in Congress to be on your side to do something about it, which you're going to need to be able to do anything. But keep in mind, this was an era of the political machine, where party bosses held sway over elected and appointed officials in a dirty system of patronage and reward, which, of course, current society in America could never relate to today. Conservative Republicans in New York, plus the Democrats of the Tammany Hall machine, had hamstrung Roosevelt's progressive agenda, stonewalling his attempts to clean up state politics and enact antitrust laws. Because Republicans were the party of big business, and both they and the old guard at Tammany regularly took bribes and campaign contributions from Standard, specifically so they would kill unfriendly legislation. Indeed, the reason Roosevelt had been nominated as vice president in the 1900 Republican convention was that New York Republicans get him out of New York. that they could get Roosevelt and his progressive reform campaigns out of New York politics. So they kicked him upstairs thinking he wouldn't do anything because he'd be vice president, which was like the, the weakest position you could possibly be in unless the president gets assassinated. 
President McKinley was sure to win re-election, they reasoned, meaning Roosevelt would be neutralized in a subordinate role with little power. It worked. For a while. Because five months into McKinley's term, an anarchist shot and killed him. And Roosevelt could suddenly use the power of the executive branch to go after the trusts. So in February of 1902, nine months before Tarbell's first Standard Oil article even appeared, Roosevelt took his first swing at the trusts. And, you know, notice they show him with boxing gloves. Roosevelt was a boxer, among many other things. In fact, he had he had a, a boxing ring set up, I think it was in the East Room of the White House, and at one point had a guy come in and he fought him, and the guy blinded Roosevelt in one eye from their boxing match. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that TR was doing. His target was the Northern Securities Company, a holding company created by the two largest rail competitors in the Midwest and West Coast, with financing by banking titan J.P. Morgan and Rockefeller. Their goal was to control all of the rail lines between the Great Lakes and the ports of the Pacific Northwest, a monopoly that, as we saw with Standard, could grant a huge amount of power to set prices and control commerce. Roosevelt's weapon was the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890, a rarely used piece of federal legislation which had been passed after a number of massive corporate mergers in the 1880s. The Sherman Act gave the federal government power to break up any organization or contract found to be restraining trade and had mostly been used against unions. So in the 1880s, this is in the aftermath of what at the time was called the Great Depression. I think it was in the early 1870s. There was a massive depression and a lot of people lost their jobs and a lot of businesses went under and you had some of these people, the Rockefellers of the world, come in and scoop up all these companies that were going out of business on the cheap. And this is where, so then in the 1880s, you start to see these massive companies being built. And so there was a response to that by the government to try and regulate those. Roosevelt instructed the Justice Department to sue and break up Northern Securities as an illegal combination. And when the department followed through, Northern Securities then appealed the decision and entered a protractive court battle. Now, Roosevelt had gone out on a limb for that fight, particularly because a significant part of his own party were pro-business and financially dependent on the trust heads. In fact, a group of conservative Republicans even revolted against him, openly plotting to nominate one of their own in the 1904 election and make this cowboy a one-term president. It was a bruising political season for Roosevelt. Actually, you know, quite literally in a way, because fun fact, while all this was going on, he'd also taken up a form of stick fencing that regularly left him with black eyes, welts, and cuts on his hands, but that's beside the badass point. <laughs> and there are so many stories like that. My favorite story of his is about the time that he was out west and somebody stole his boat. And my man got an axe, chopped down some trees, made another boat, chased these guys down the river without sleep for a couple of days, captured them, and without sleep, like I said, brought them back to face justice. <laughs> That's the kind of guy we're talking about here. This dude does not mess around. Because he was not done. He was just getting started. That year, he personally intervened in a coal miner's strike, mediating between the miners and J.P. Morgan to strike a bargain that raised wages and limited hours, but prevented the formation of a union. And then in 1903, with the swell of support from Ida Tarbell's articles, he moved on a much more ambitious set of bills. He wanted to create a Department of Commerce and Labor with an investigative agency called the Bureau of Corporations that would monitor and inspect companies for antitrust violations. In addition, he wanted to give more power to the already existing Interstate Commerce Commission and pass a law preventing railroads from giving rebates that diverted from published rates. All of this would give him the tools to go after the trusts on a broad scale. Congress was not cooperative. Republicans tried to prevent the proposal from coming to a vote, and many Democrats, hoping to paint Roosevelt as pro-trust, felt he didn't go far enough. But both parties said there simply wasn't enough time in the spring congressional session for this discussion. So put it off until the elections, let the vo voice of the people be heard. Then they have a little more security and then they can stand up for what they want to stand up for right after the elections. Yeah, this is where TR is going to bring in the idea of the bully pulpit, which now we take for granted as something that people do. People use the power of the office of president, the gravitas, the uh, the the automatic kind of voice that gives you to steer public opinion. But that was something that was kind of new on the scene. So Roosevelt used the bully pulpit. 
He threatened to call a special session, which would keep the congressman from going home. And he engaged the press, letting it be known that Rockefeller had sent out telegrams to a number of Republican senators calling in favors from a lifetime of financial gifts. Oh yeah, the public uproar was enormous. Newspapers speculated which senators had been bought by Rockefeller and the trusts. Reporters bombarded senators' offices. And mm. gradually, Roosevelt got his votes. In a last-ditch attempt to scuttle the laws, Standard Oil sent a team of lawyers to D.C. with instructions to draft an amendment that would blunt the bills and pass it to their Republican allies. But then Pulitzer's New York World found out about this, and the lawyers fled the Capitol with reporters on their heels. <laughs> Roosevelt had his Bureau of Corporations, his legislation, and the next year, his first victory. The Supreme Court ruled 5-4 to four that the government had been right to break up the Northern Securities Company. The it's amazing how many really significant kind of like history altering decisions have been 5-4. I won't get into those now cuz I don't want to get into modern politics or anything like that, but especially recently there've been a lot of decisions that have been 5-4 that have dramatically altered the landscape of US history. Era of trust busting had begun and John D Rockefeller would become the richest fugitive in America. <laughs> and what so this is a fascinating story. I'm excited to continue the conversation. So let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. Highly recommend you get into learning more about Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, I've never read a book on him. I've, I've watched a lot of documentaries and, and read stories and tidbits here and there. But I'm really curious to get into a book about this topic. So if you have any good recommendations about a book about Theodore Roosevelt. If you like documentaries, if you like Ken Burns' Civil War documentary, he has one on the Roosevelt's on Teddy uh, Theodore Roosevelt and also Franklin, who was his distant cousin and also his uh, nephew-in-law. Um, so check that out if you like documentaries and want to watch that. But let me know if you have any suggestions about a really good book about Theodore Roosevelt. I'd be curious to, to read that. Thanks. All right. So as promised, I almost forgot to do this when I was ending the video. Uh, this is from 1932. So this is the, um, the middle of the Great Depression. And this is John D. Rockefeller in his 90s talking about the return of prosperity for America. So my immediate reaction to that really isn't even about what he said, but it's just to 93 year old man, first of all, full life for sure. You know, one of the richest men who ever lived, first billionaire in world history. But it's a good reminder, too, that no matter what you do in this life, it does come to an end. Our lives are finite. They have a beginning and an end. And even the richest, most successful, most powerful men in the world can't stop time. Uh, so that's just kind of my... Uh, I, but it's cool. It's cool to see uh, someone from history like that and hear them speak and kind of see them as living, breathing people and not just people we read about on a page. So, all right. Uh, with that, we're going to wrap things up. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again soon.